really uh, happy to be the moderator actually because <laughs> I'm personally really interested in what they're going to say. And uh, here at the Disruption Network Club, we have been really caring a lot about data and we want to know more about that. So I think that uh, here at the panel, we have really the perfect people that can uh, illuminate us. And uh, so, as I say, the uh, panel is called Leaking Massive uh, Data Sets, uh, Security, Openness and Collective Mobilization. And I have uh, uh, here with me um, Friedrich Lindenberg, from, that is the data team lead from OCCRP, the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. And then uh, uh, on the right, uh, Ryan Gallagher, that is investigative reporter and uh, editor at The Intercept. And uh, um, what we want to discuss here is uh, from one side, the ethic of massive uh, data leaks. Uh, that is a subject that uh, concerns with the discourse of uh, security and secrecy uh, versus openness and transparency. So one question that uh, would come in mind is uh, who controls the data, who access the data. At the same time, we mentioned the discourse of security. So the analysis of uh, uh, the strategies of indexing data and uh, at the same time, also the discourse of source protection and privacy of data. And finally, the discourse of transparency that uh, we already touched upon in the panel before. So the question related to open investigations, but also the discourse of collective mobilization that uh, is something really important to analyze. And in this specific subject, uh, I mean, many of you probably know the story of the Panama Papers uh, was a leak it was uh, um, a huge, massive amount of data that was leaked in 2015. It was uh, 11.5 million financial and legal records uh, that came from the Panama-based law firm Mossack Fonseca. Then uh, uh, the uh, following one was the Bahama leaks uh, that was in September 2016. And we are speaking about 1.3 million companies register files. And the Paradise Paper, November 2017, a set of 13.4 million leaked confidential electronic documents about offshore investments. So in a sense, you know, speaking about these data leaks, <laughs> we have a problem of uh, a huge amount of data that has been, uh, that needs to be analyzed. And, uh, the question is uh, how? Uh, for example, for uh, the Panama Papers, we will discuss this tomorrow, um, the Süddeutsche Zeitung uh, reporter Frederick Obermeier and Bastian Obermeier decided, decide to uh, contact uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism to uh, analyze this data. But uh, of course, there could be also other possibilities. And um, in a sense, uh, the discussion that we want to have here today is related to what is the right and ethical choice of analyzing massive uh, leaks and also how can we guarantee source and privacy uh, data protection and also in which way it is possible to engage the people and also create collective mobilization because when we speak about such huge amount of data it's also really difficult to, to share them. So I want to start by introducing our great speakers that know much more than me about this. <laughs> so I stop speaking here. Um, we, have, we start with Ryan, that is an investigative journalist and editor for The Intercept. And his work focuses on the intersection between national security, technology and human rights. And he was previously a contributing writer for Slate. And his work has been appearing in The Guardian, Financial Time, the Sydney uh, Morning Herald, The Independence, Art Technica, The Huffington Post, and New uh, Statement, among others, a lot of them. And then uh, Friedrich, here, Lindenberg, uh, leads the data team at the OCCRP, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, as I say, and is responsible for the development of the OCCRP data and supports ongoing investigation where data analysis is needed. And he was before a Knight International uh, Journalist Fellow, 
and also uh, previously a night Mozilla Open New Fellow of the Spiegel Online in Hamburg. Before of that, <laughs> yes, there is still something important. Um, he was an open data activist that worked to promote uh, the release of government information about uh, public finance, lobbying, and also lawmaking across the world. So the activist part was important, I mean. Um, yes, so uh, let's start right now with uh, Ryan and then uh, Friedrich with uh, uh, present afterward, if uh, each presentation is something like 25 minutes, so uh, just to let you know, and then we will have a little debate and we open to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana, for the introduction. Um, yeah, so as Tatiana mentioned, I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me or, or, or the work that I do, I'm an investigative reporter and editor with uh, a US news website called The Intercept, and some of the, the, the big sort of leaks or document dumps that I've been involved in reporting in recent years have been, um, one that I'm sure most of you will be familiar with is the, the Snowden um, documents, which I, I was involved in reporting for a few years with The Intercept and a whole range of other uh, news organizations. Um, we also published a, a few years ago um, a series called The Drone Papers, which was uh, a leak of documents about the US government's um, secret drone warfare program. It's the only leak of its kind that's actually come out about the, the US drone program still to this day. Uh, and more recently, I've been working on a, a series of stories about um, Google in the, the United States and its um, attempt to um, build a censored um, search engine for China and we had a, a whistleblower who disclosed documents to us about that and that, it's been an ongoing series of stories now for about um, eight months or so and it's still sort of um, rumbling on. So that's, that's my background. Um, but today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk kind of generally about um, what, it, what it's like in journalism to be involved in reporting on big um, big leaks of information, big, do big disclosures of documents, what it's like to work with whistleblowers. I think that, um, you know, generally speaking, when we do these stories, um, there's a lot of noise around that happens and there's a lot of headlines, but people often, I think it's kind of opaque, the work that we do behind the scenes and people are often, I think, don't really understand uh, some of the, the, the discussions that go on before actually you get to the point of hitting the publish button on the story. So I wanted to, for the benefit of hopefully many of you who are not actually involved in, in working in the media here, um, to, to just give a bit of an insight and maybe provide some context to some of the discussions that are going to be going on around, um, for example, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers uh, that we'll get into, I think, in the, the question and answer session and um, in the film later on and, and all that. So, um, for, first of all, I wanted to give a bit of history um, and a bit, again, a bit more context to, to all of this, all of this stuff, because we, we often just exist in a kind of present day bubble it, it feels like and we're fo focusing on the here and now but um, what's really interesting to me is looking back you know just a, a few decades to the big um, the big leaks of of the of past years and um, past generations so I picked out a couple um, of those some of the more famous ones um, out of the US uh, which is the the Pentagon Papers and the, the Cointel Pro leaks now, um, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with, with uh, certainly the Pentagon Papers, which was a disclosure of, of documents about um, the Vietnam War and the US government's lies to the public about the Vietnam War. And a, a whistleblower came forward in um, the early 70s and actually disclosed what was 7,000 um, 7, pages of, of documents, um, which at the time was absolutely a massive amount of information to be passed to journalists. Um, caused a massive scandal in, in the United States and, and really shaped the course of the, of the Vietnam War and probably contributed heavily to its, its end um, because it stirred up huge opposition to the war. Um, the the Cointel Pro leaks was a, a case actually where a bunch of activists broke into FBI offices and stole about a thousand pages of documents revealing um, FBI domestic surveillance activities in a program called Counter Pro, which had involved targeting um, civil rights activists and people like, um, including Martin Luther King um, uh, through, that, through the period of um, 
of a massive protest in the United States and also um, they were targeting um, anti-Vietnam um, protesters, even some, poli uh, some lawmakers in the US again triggered a huge scandal, but it's only a thousand pages of documents. Um, the present day, if you just look, the, 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 the graph is illustrating quite starkly, I think, the, um, some of the more recent ones we're familiar with, the, the Cablegate, um, the WikiLeaks um, disclosure of US diplomatic cables, Iraq war logs, again, WikiLeaks, Snowden disclosures, the recent WikiLeaks disclosure of a whole range of CIA, CIA um, internal documents. These are all in the hundreds of thousands. So you're going in a, in a space of a few decades from a massive leak being considered about 7,000 pages to hundreds of thousands and then of course some of the, the even more recent ones and what the ones that are focus of a lot of discussions today and tomorrow at this conference um the paradise papers the panama papers you're into you know more than 11 million more than um, 13 million um documents so the this, the trajectory of what we're dealing with in journalism is really extraordinary just in terms of scale um with the the, the pentagon papers in uh, the early 70s what Ellsberg, the, the leaker he actually was doing, um, is fascinating story is that he was, he, each day he was working for a, a contractor, a government contractor called the Rand Corporation and it had a copy of this secret um, Pentagon Papers study and he decided to disclose it. But to do that, every day he was going into his office and he was smuggling out a small amount of the papers so just enough that he could stash in his briefcase and he would leave the building that day and he would then go in the evening and make copies of those documents using a xerox machine and it took him something like three three months it was several months till he was able to actually make the copies. And at one point, he even roped in his family to help him to copy the documents. He had his young children who were like, like 10 years old at the time, helping him to photocopy these documents, which when you think about it, it's just extraordinary. But this is the process that he had to go through. And I've used this old picture um, of a, an example of a room filled with pages to make an illustration. Um, that's the kind of process that Ellsberg was going through in the early 70s. Now, when you consider the, the process present day for a whistleblower or a, le or a leaker, one of these little things, I mean, you could probably get 100, 200, 300, 400 rooms like this stacked full of pages of documents, compressed and digitized and stored in one of these. That has had such a profound impact. I think we take it for granted sometimes just because we're used to it now, but it's had such a profound impact on obviously society, but for, um, obviously for the purposes of this, I'm talking about journalism because what it means is that whistleblowers today, they are now in a position to, they don't have to do the process Ellsberg went through. They don't have to spend four months smuggling out documents to copy them. They can copy and paste thousands upon thousands of documents onto one of these tiny little SD cards. And obviously that's easier to smuggle out than, than you know, hundreds of thousands of pages of documents on this. It's, it's easy, it's trivial to, to get that out of a building um, for, in most cases, and, and, and except in extreme high security circumstances. Um, and of course, this for, for journalists, this is creating new problems, new challenges, because when Ellsberg was doing his, um, his leaks and also like the Cointel Pro case with a thousand pages of documents, the reporters who are getting those documents, they're having to sit and manually read every single page, you know, go through it one by one, highlight it, pull out extracts, um, contextualize it. It's such a laborious and long process to do that, to just manually have to read thousands of documents. So there is just no chance, no chance at all um, that you're going to be able to do that when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands or even millions, tens of millions of, of documents. It just isn't possible. So when it comes to some whistleblower or leaker um, provides a reporter with, with this information on one of these SD cards or however they've, they've provided it to you, um, the, the process, I wanted to just give a bit of insight into the kind of general you know, step-by-step -step process that you would go through. First of all, I'll probably put them in the wrong order here because the first one really would be securing the data. What you want to be doing is 
and how I work and how we've worked on a lot of the big projects I've been involved with is we, we actually just completely segregate the information from the internet. We will buy new computers that have never connected to the internet and we will use those to analyze the data. And to analyze the data, we'll use, uh, processing the data here, um, we use uh, forensic um, software programs such as um, there's one called Intella that I've used in the past, which is actually more commonly used, quite ironically to a certain extent, by the police and intelligence services to um, basically mine through documents. When you get one of these SD cards or someone's provided hundreds of thousands of documents, you're dealing with, sometimes it's just like raw files that you can't even open with any normal um, software application. So you have to actually get an index and all that. You have, you have image files, you know, it can be spreadsheets, it can be Word documents, it can be PDFs, it can be JPEG files of scanned documents, it can be, you know, photographs, it can be just all manner of things. So you want to use something that indexes it all and you can then like type in a keyword or a, you can search for a phrase and the, the software will do the hard work for you because it just mines through the documents, um, identifies the, the, the things that might be interesting to you, that might be potentially newsworthy. But before you get to that point, of course, you have to verify the information. You can, unfortunately, get people who will try to furnish journalists with fake um, or forged documents in order to try and discredit a, a particular reporter or a news organization by having them publish what would then be subsequently proven to be fake. So there's a long process of verification you have to go through which involves the kind of conventional going out and speaking to, to sources, um, getting second opinions, and, and it usually quite soon becomes clear uh, what you're, whether what you're dealing with is, is real or not. Um, but th there's obviously a lot of ethical issues raised by dealing with large, um, large documents uh, sets and uh, chief among them, if you're provided uh, 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 one of these archives, you're asking, well, well, you want to know who, who is it that's given me this? Because it's not always immediately clear to you. Um, the person could be a hacker, they have penetrated a government, or they have penetrated a corporation and actually stolen those documents for, they may have a particular political agenda, it may even be a former employee who is disgruntled and they've targeted their former employer. Um, it could even be a, a spy, as we've seen in the, the case with the, the US election in 2016, the role of the Russian state and um, the Clinton email hacks and circulating emails in order to create a sort of chaos in the US election cycle. Um, or of course, it can be a, a whistleblower. And, and that, those, that would usually be the, the case you would prefer to work with as, as a whistleblower. Um, there's less baggage associated usually with that and the person is acting out of principle because they probably identified some kind of wrongdoing uh, which they believe should be publicly um, exposed. But, um, uh, another big issue for us is that it's not always possible to name the source. Even if you know the person's name, even if you've verified who they are, you, you've checked even their, their employment history, you, you know exactly who this person is, they might not want to be named because, um, of course, naming a person can put them at great risk. They can lose their job, um, they could be put in jail, they could be even assassinated or murdered, or it depends on how extreme you go on the spectrum and who, who you're dealing with. Um, so there are all kinds of issues around naming a source. In, in the Snowden case, he wanted to go public, just like um, Daniel Ellsberg in the 70s, because he thought it was important that the public understood the motivations of the person behind the, the disclosure, and he wanted to put his face to it and come forward and explain. But not everyone's in a position to be able to do that, and so some people don't. Um, and also, you know, it's sometimes the case that you will never learn the identity. Even the reporters will not know who the person is because you'll be provided documents which you can verify, but you can't be sure who is the, the person who's given it. And that was the case actually for a period of time through the, um, with the Clinton and the Democratic Party email hacks. It wasn't 100% clear for a long time, even though there was a lot of speculation who this Guccifer character was who in one case was involved in providing reporters with hacked emails and it turned out that was um, evidently a, a cutout for the Russian state. It wasn't, it wasn't clear though who, that, who really that person was even though it was obviously a sketchy individual. Um, uh, and going down the list of, of other issues you would be facing, 
redaction and publication of source material. This is always the hardest part, actually, when it gets to the stage of thinking about actually publishing the stories, because um, there's usually a lot of arguments and discussions around what can and can't be public. Um, there will be a lot of very good reasons for redactions, including there can be, you could be dealing with cases of victims of sexual assault who are exposed in certain documents. You could have informants to the government who are like operating in a country like the Middle East who, if their identity was known, they would be undoubtedly just killed. So you can have serious cases, or you know, uh, in the case of the Snowden leaks, uh, examples of um, uh, undercover operatives or um, undercover assets in areas where there's conflict going on and, and, and exposure of those could cause risk to life. So there, there's always a lot of discussions around that and generally what the, the sort of rule we have is if, it, if, there's a, if there's a small risk of harm to a person, well then you err on the side of caution and you, you will redact that. But um, there's a broad, broad spectrum of opinion in this area and um, of course, on the more radical uh, side of it, you have a, an organization like WikiLeaks, which is sort of vehemently against redaction as a principle and will publish large sets of documents without um, redacting. And um, more a moderate perspective, which would be most news organizations, which would try to more, do more curated publication of documents and, and redact uh, in order to try to um, limit uh, the potential harms to people who are named in those documents. Um, I'll s move forward. Um, so I've touched on them, this a bit, but the, the risks, there's a lot of risks involved. Um, first of all, uh, I mentioned the, the ease of copying and transmitting large sets of documents to reporters because of the digitization of documents. Um, that is in principle easy. Um, and it's easy to just copy documents onto the to the storage device. The problem is now that obviously governments and corporations are becoming wise to that, and they have been for many years, and they are installing what they call um, insider threat uh, programs on their computer systems. And these programs, for those of you who have not heard of them before, they basically, it's almost like a kind of corporate or government malware. It's, it's like it's, it's logging all employee um, activity on the computer. So every time you plug in a USB or a SD card into your computer, it's getting logged on a central system. And every time you print a document, it's getting logged on a central system. Every time you type a certain thing, all your key log will be getting recorded. They can even be taking um, screenshots of your actual computer without you um, knowing that it's actually actively happening. Um, so that creates a massive risk because to the source, they can be quite easily identified uh, if there's suddenly a leak of information from a, a company or a government agency, they can sort of go back in time and they can say, well, who has accessed that document? Who has printed that document? What date did they do that? They can then check your emails what your, on your employee email account, see if you've had contact with reporters or, you know, sometimes sources make these mistakes. People aren't always um, savvy with security, so they will, they will make mistakes. And this is why we have what's called the first contact problem. Um, sometimes uh, the, the key com communication in any relationship with a whistleblower or a source is just that first contact, the first email, the first text message, the first phone call because if that person has not taken the precautions for that first phone call or text measure, whatever it is, there's a permanent record that they've contacted you, they've contacted a reporter, and if down the line, after that first contact, you as a reporter try to get the person to take more precautions, you will meet them in person, you will um, make sure they're encrypting or and using anonymity tools to protect themselves, it doesn't matter because the first contact is still there. There's a permanent record of it. And so that's a big problem that we face. And this is one of the big risks in terms of um, whistleblowers being exposed and have been caught. Um, we also have um, obvious, probably quite obvious risks where cyber attack, which is just um, the potential for being hacked by an adversary, especially when you're dealing with classified government documents, um, every 
spy agency in the world wants to know what, what document, wants a copy of those documents. They want to try and hack you. So this is why, as I mentioned before, we work, we try to work in an environment that's disconnected completely from the internet. Um, with legal attack, um, you can have threats of libel action. Corporations can try to shut down your reporting uh, using, uh, I'm based in England and there's very bad libel laws for journalists there and people can shut, shut your reporting down just by accusing you of libel. Even if it's bullshit, they can use the legal mechanism to cripple a news organization because the finances involved in fighting the libel action are just like debilitating and they know that and so the rich a lot of the big companies especially like in the actually in the finance world they are, are expert at doing this um, and of course physical attacks sadly we've had many cases uh, more and more of them unfortunately especially in eastern europe and of course in malta and russia uh, of um, reporters being assassinated um, and also there's great risk to, to sources in, in all parts of the world um, of some kind of physical retribution. Um, you know, uh, I, we worked on a story uh, last year, I think it was, um, involving a defector from the Assad regime who was exposing the assassination of the journalist Marie Colvin. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, the, the, the risk to, to, of assassination for that person is just, I mean, it's, a, it's immediate if that person is exposed. So th there are very, quite, quite scary at times risks. And um, I'm, I'm always amazed at the, the courage of the people who come forward because they really take um, extraordinary risks to themselves to bring information out to the public. And we're always very grateful f to them for that. Um, just finally, I'm gonna try and wrap this up. Um, the defences to, to, to some of the some of these attacks sort of that I'm describing and some of the problems that we face, one of the best ones is to build partnerships. Um, in reporting, there's a terrible culture of, of of being quite competitive, and so one news organisation is always trying to like scoop the other news organisation, and this is very toxic, I think, because what's far more powerful and what's far better, especially when you're dealing with big document um, leaks, is to collaborate together, um, because not only then are you having a bigger impact in terms of you're reaching a larger audience, obviously, because if you're if, if I'm um, reporting out of the US and we're working with Spiegel in Germany and Le Monde and, and France and Volksgrant and Netherlands, all at the same time, you have a massive, you, you're reaching more people and that's ultimately what you want to get the information out to as much people as you can. But more so than that, you're creating a firewall against attack because there's no single point that you can be sort of snuffed out they can't silence you with um, some le bullshit legal case. They can't, um, they, they can't try and you know, hack your computer in some way and, and, shut, and shut you down. Uh, in the UK, during the stolen leaks, the, U the British government threatened to injunct, injunct to the Guardian newspaper and stop the reporting using a, a sort of ancient legal mechanism, which it, it could have done legally. Um, and the Guardian then moved its operations to the US and started working with the New York Times and others to, um, to evade that threat. So working together in partnership is a very, very good way to, um, to ensure that the reporting can, be, can, can continue to happen even under threat from, from governments and because you're operating in multiple jurisdictions at one, at one time. Also though pooling resources um, because you know, the resources that newsrooms have are limited and so to be able to pool your resources uh, together is a very valuable thing journalistically. You also learn from other, other, other reporters professionally. I mean uh, I've worked with um, reporters from, um, all across Europe and almost in every continent now in, in Japan and I've learned so much just from working with colleagues and yeah, thank you in other countries so um, it's just a better way of working and finally uh, another another key defense and another thing that going forward we're always looking for and that we always want to uh, to to sort of help to support is the development of new tools for journalists to collaborate and to communicate in, in secure uh, ways we have a system and many news organizations now have it called a secure drop which is a means to uh, for a whistleblower to leak um, information avoiding the 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 sort of um, first contact problem that I described because it uses a combination of an, an, an anonymity um, internet 
uh, browser called uh, Tor and PGP encryption. And the combination of these things is really the best um, defense that we have electronically against um, state surveillance um, of, of our sources. So, but we're always looking for to work with um, technologists um, you know, software developers and who, who are, have new ideas for how we can better collaborate. And we are con I think we always have to constantly evolve in this area because, like I said at the start, there's so many challenges when it comes to working with, when you're dealing with millions of documents, it's, um, we, we really rely on technology to, do, to help us do things in a more efficient way. And I think that um, the more that we can collaborate, not just as, as journalists, but as um, technologists, software developers, um, archivists, uh, data engineers, whatever your profession, uh, everyone really has something to bring to the table. And I believe very strongly that the more that we can collaborate together, um, the better, more powerful a job that we can do, the more efficient we can do journalism. Uh, and and um, it helps us to bring the stories out and to get the information out to the public in the best way and you know the fastest and most efficient way possible which is um probably a goal that we we would all support so thank you very much that's all Thank you very much i think this applause should also go to the people that really risk a lot for uh, bringing the truth out, as you also say. And uh, now we, I, I give the word to Friedrich for his presentation. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. Um, so I've already been introduced. Um, I'm working for the OSSCRP. And yeah, I don't have a fantastic bar chart, but I have a GIF. Um, everything is leaking, right? So um, you've shown the growth over the last 30, oh, Ah, maybe there's going to be a GIF. I promise you a GIF. <laughs> um, but we've seen this, this development um, not only over the last 30, 40 years, um, but also, I've got a GIF now, it's amazing. Um, but also really within, I think, even the last three or four years, right? I think kind of WikiLeaks and then the Panama Papers, it's really created a narrative that many people um, who are in positions where they're seeing wrongdoing, um, are embracing to say, okay, yeah, we need to, um, we need to bring this to light. And also, I think there's like an odd sweet spot that we've achieved between like how good we are at doing information security and how many secrets there are still in the world. And somehow this is kind of working a little bit in our favor right now, where the people who have really interesting secrets, like the offshore industry, are not actually yet that good at keeping them secret. And um, however that happens, that's definitely in our interest. Obviously, there's a massive downside to that as well. But really what that means for journalism, yeah, it's, it's, it needs to develop on steroids, right? We need to look at our industry and we need to, need to look at basically how we can kind of develop both how we work um, as, a, as a social construct, how we work as a, as a practice, and also um, what kind of tools we have. And you just spoke about this. Um, but before I go more into that, maybe a quick word about OCCRP. It's already been, been mentioned very kindly before, but basically what it is is a, a network of investigative outlets. Um, our traditional focus is in Central and Eastern Europe. We have 35 member centers, most of whom are in, basically they're small, four, seven investigative journalists, um, non-profit centers in, in, in Central and Eastern European countries. We now also have a team working in South Africa and in Colombia, and so slowly it's expanding. Um, overall, I think at the moment we're kind of the, the largest investigative organization in the world, which is kind of odd. Um, but uh, the idea is really that if you are doing um, investigations, right, and you're looking into tobacco smuggling in Serbia and you're looking into tobacco or another type of crime in, in Romania, really it turns out that what, what you're doing is you're not, you're not working on two separate stories. More often than not, you're kind of pulling at two different ends of the same kind of tapestry because um, more than journalism, more than politics, crime definitely has become a globalized business in part and in very large part due to this kind of offshore financial system. Um, and in part also, I think, because people were just real visionaries in designing how they could use the, the arbitra arbitrage between different legal systems, diff different kind of legal regimes um, uh, to, to, to A, steal money, and B, then make it disappear, right? Um, so um, what we're working on is really kind of grand corruption. We're working on 
um, cases where there's, there's been large scale kind of theft, um, often enough you've got these, these, these like I'm, I'm, I'm a very innocent German dude, right? And I come there and I think it's all so cliche, right? It's right out of Hollywood. You've got the daughter of the autocrat who takes a $2 billion bribe um, to let the telco company come into, into, into her father's country, right? Um, you've got um, all these kind of very cliche stories. You've got this entire country that's run by four or five families and, and then um, the, the president, if he wants to stay in power, has to marry uh, the daughter of the most important oligarch and um, their, their daughters then obviously in turn buy massive properties in London because that's where you want to go if your own country is kind of in a weird place. And, and so it's, it's very kind of um, I interesting to see that this actual kind of vaguely James Bond-ish world ac actually exists and is kind of thriving in 2019. Um, and so, um, yeah, our focus has really been to uncover these ca uh, uh, cases where kleptocracies have established themselves, have taken entire governments into their, into their control and are now squeezing it forever is in there, right? Whether it's kind of taking the last of money out of the railway system, out of the extractive sector, out of the healthcare system, um, out of, out of um, whatever industry or kind of sector of society there is that money can still be taken from. Um, banking sector was mentioned a few times and is obviously um, a good place to find money. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're trying to bring, bring together these teams across different countries. And it's, I think it's very much inspired um, by the, the, the work that, um, uh, to some extent, even WikiLeaks started, but that was then also kind of moved forward by, by ICIJ and that kind of OCCIP has been kind of ramping up for the past 10 years in terms of bringing together teams from different countries, teams from um, countries where the money is being taken, but also teams from countries where the money is then being deposited um, in, in, in safety, in relative safety, right? And um, leaks have played a massive role in this. This is kind of two years worth of basically reporting that we've been working on that is, if not driven by leaks, then at least heavily um, uh, enabled by, by leaked information. Um, and at this point, it's really a thing where if there's like two or three weeks where we don't receive um, some kind of large document dump of, 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 of some shape or form, um, it's, a real, um, uh, it's a real surprise to me. And um, the other thing, like basically there's been narratives in this, um, We've worked a, a little bit on, um, on the Daphne project, which was dedicated to um, uh, Daphne Karuna Galicia. Um, I also think I should mention her son here, Matthew Karuna Galicia, who's basically been doing all the engineering for ICIJ um, on the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers, and um, uh, his family had to pay a massive price for that. Um, uh, and, um, and yeah, since then, one of the themes in and in our reporting at OCCOP has been in particular kind of this, this theme of the laundromat, right? Um, so these are basically what, what the gentleman maybe may have meant when he talked about shadow banking systems. Basically systems that allow people to take money out of, um, out of, of, of countries, mostly in East, Central and Eastern Europe, and then move them through European banks that appear to be complicit in this. Um, Danske Bank is, is probably the most prominent example of this, but also Swedbank um, has, been, has, been, has been mentioned. Um, and, um, and then basically bring them into whatever use is intended for them, whether it's stowing it away somewhere on a Cyprus bank account, whether it's bringing it into real estate, um, or whether it is to kind of um, use it on luxury goods and, and, and other kind of immediate kind of use. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting for me to see the extent to which, basically, um, apparently sometime in the, in the early 2000s you could just walk into the right office in Moscow, you could say, hey, I have uh, $100 million that I do not want to talk about and can you make them show up in, in Germany, right? Can you make them show up in Berlin? I'd like to buy some, some property on Kurfürstendamm. Um, and um, the fact that this has kind of been, been almost productized as a, as a service industry that kind of runs on top of the, the traditional banking system but um, somehow fully exploits it um, uh, in a way that makes it in, in, in inconceivable that there's not, uh, not, not awareness of this um, has, has really kind of shocked me. Um, so at the beginning of the, of the um, last month in, in March, we released a, a new story called the Troika Laundromat, which details one of these enterprises 
And um, luckily, sometimes these things have an impact. Um, this is the stock price of the Austrian Raiffeisen Bank. And um, I, I encourage you to find the point where we published um, the story about money laundering um, when there was 12% gone. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice to see that sometimes that we, we actually have an impact with this and that uh, basically there is an audience that is listening to this, um, both within kind of the compliance industry, which is a very odd place, um, but also within, within legal and political authorities, prosecutors, um, I think US courts were mentioned. I'm, I'm, I'm always stunned by how much of the world's dirty work has to be carried out in the Southern District of New York. Um, no, like every, 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 every country has some kind of major scandal going on and then it doesn't actually follow up on it itself and, and instead kind of someone has to find some way that it involves the US and then it ends up on formerly Preet Bahara's desk and he has to clean it up, um, which doesn't seem like the most sustainable legal architecture for the world. Um, but anyway, so um, uh, yeah, as I, as I said, this is kind of also a problem for us in, in, in how do we work, right? Um, so when we get this data, right, we need to process it, and that's kind of the, the part that you were talking about, it, right, um, in, in the sense that we need, to, we need to kind of do the technical work of making data that comes accessible to reporters. Um, but then also I think much more important is kind of the, the following steps of finding links that link this data and link the information that's in a leak um, to kind of a bigger narrative and to a, um, to a, to a context that it really needs to be, needs to be looked at in. And I, I also want to very briefly mention, obviously, kind of the, the security aspect of this. Um, uh, there's, there's basically the big problem we have is that we're working with people who are in 40 different countries. Um, they're all facing extremely different situations. None of them are particularly great. I think we're going to have a fantastic panel tomorrow afternoon um, with uh, Pelin, who's somewhere here, and Khadija Ismailova. Um, talking about um, the, the human cost that this is taking if, it's, if, if it goes wrong. And basically, in many cases, it's a question of when, not if, on whether this is going to go wrong. And so security, obviously, is, is, a, is, a, is a massive concern with all of this. Um, but um, looking at um, technology-wise, one of the things that OCCIP has been, been trying to do over the last three or four years is basically to develop tooling um, that would allow us to kind of handle um, leaks not as a kind of magic kind of Christmas event, but as a continuous process almost, right? Looking at them as a, as a thing that is, is happening every week, every month. And so we've, we've started working on this thing um, called the Aleph Project, um, which basically creates a data management system. And the idea is to bring together data from different sources, um, not only from leaked data sources, um, but also from, um, um, from public records and from company databases, from procurement databases, so that basically we, we don't only have the raw stuff that comes out, um, but we also have, have the necessary context. And um, of course, we have the ability to connect this to, uh, to, to, um, uh, between, between these two things. And um, a big goal for us in this is kind of open source development, right? Because doing this is extremely expensive. There's very few news organizations that really want to invest the resource to do software development. Um, we have to because otherwise we couldn't, we couldn't deal with the influx of material that's coming. Um, but really we, we are hoping to build kind of um, more and more of a community around this. So um, uh, the, the software that, we're, that we've made is, is being uh, it's been released as an open source package. It has a developer community around it. And if anyone here is interested in hacking on something good, um, then uh, come, come hang out and, and we will find interesting things for you to do. Um, going beyond the fun open source bit though, um, there's still this issue of kind of leaks, treating them as puzzle pieces, right? Because I think there's, there's a real risk of, of, of a leak becoming kind of this fetish object, right? And on the other hand, kind of also underappreciating them. So one of the things that, that, that we've been, we've been um, importing into our database is a, is a, is a data set um, that's kind of known as Kaza Word. Um, this was released in 2014. And almost like clockwork, every month, um, a reporter goes to our site, looks up some name, and finds a reference to that person, to that politician in Kaza Word, right? And I think the, the risk that we have often is that someone would, would use a leak for two weeks, read some of the emails in there. Because it's so much, we can't actually read all of it. 
um, and so kind of do three good stories and then put it aside and forget about it. And instead, what we need to do is we need to look at these as kind of resources that, that are long-term resources that we can um, piece together more and more using public records and other kind of augmentative information into a puzzle of, the, of this offshore industry, right? Um, so basically, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this as a countering technique to the fragmentation that really underlies this idea of offshore finance, right? So um, if people are trying to make it more and more complex by, by putting different bits and pieces in different places, um, then one of the ways that we can counter it is by really making sure that it's easy to, to look in many of these places in one go and find, um, find, find as many references to a particular person or company um, from these places. Um, and so, yeah, what we've done is we've basically built a massive data archive. Um, we've got somewhere around 30 million uh, documents that includes emails and images and whatever. And we've also put in a ton of kind of databases. So um, whenever there's like a data set leaked that includes, I don't know, a, a procurement database that comes out as open data or a, a census that gets, gets, gets stolen or sold on the black market to, to, to someone and then ends up on BitTorrent. And that's the kind of stuff that we're really trying to piece together. Um, it's a resource. Uh, some, of it, some of it we make available to the general public, but uh, much of it is also we, we feel um, sensitive because it is, um, it is ugly information. It's not information that I'm, I'm super excited to kind of keep. Um, it's, it's information that we need to have in order to piece stuff together. Um, but it is also radioactive in the sense that it's, um, it, it contains a lot of, lot of really sensitive information about a lot of private and even innocent individuals, right? Uh, because there's no way for us to kind of figure out who has committed crimes without looking at a broader picture of what is the overall economic activity that's going on. Um, uh, yeah, but then obviously there's, there's the challenges, and I think you've done a really good kind of review of all the ways that this can go wrong. Um, that, that, that inf processing information um, can end you up in a, in a situation in your life where you don't want to be. Um, maybe a quick detour. I mean, there was, a, there was a news item this morning indicating that Assange might be um, transferred from Ecuadorian embassy to, um, to uh, basically British um, prison at some point relatively soon, right? And that, I think, creates a very awkward moment for us, right? Because on the one hand, the man really hasn't endeared himself to anyone recently. Um, on the other hand, the cable gate and the Iraq war logs were some invaluable reporting, right? And if, on the basis of what he, and WikiLeaks more broadly, did, um, um, what, what, what they did, um, he, can be, he can be put in jail in the US, then it presents a more general problem for, um, for the freedom of the press in, in the United States and I guess, I guess globally. Um, so we're gonna be in a really awkward spot there apparently quite soon. Um, and and in, in general, I think that kind of leads us to, 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 to have to think more about what, what are the things that we, we, can, we can do when we deal with leaked information that mitigate the risk of someone ending up in an embassy for seven years um, in basically custody. Um, and I think one part of that is um, not letting ourselves be too driven by, by, by leaks, right? There's information coming out all the time now and it's almost hard for us to, to follow what information is, is there. And really kind of the thing that a journalist needs to look for is what is a great story. And if there's a great story, and there's a leak, that's great. If there's a great story and there's no leak, that's fantastic too. If there's a great leak but no good story, then that's really kind of an, uh, almost a, a psyop attack on a journalist, right? Because the value of leaks in themselves in our industry has been, has been put quite high. And so there's a temptation in some cases to, to do the leak even if there's no story, right? And that's, that's something that we really need to avoid. Um, the other thing is that leaks are obviously weapons. And I... Um, I, don't, I don't have, to, I have, to have time. I, I feel like um, this is something that has happened much less in, um, in, 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 in kind of the, the, the European, US kind of hemisphere than it has happened apparently in Central and Eastern Europe, um, where really at, at some point everybody is getting hacked. And I, I even feel there's a slight kind of cultural communication issue around what happened with the 2016 election, where I think what happened was meant to be more of a, I don't know, I'm, I'm speaking, speaking very widely here, but. Um, was, 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 was 
much more common in a, in a Russian context or in, a, in an Eastern European context than it is in an American context. And so maybe, maybe it was meant more as a joke by, by the Russians than anything else. Um, but, but really kind of looking at, at leaks as weapons and saying, hey, um, it, someone is trying to harm someone. I'm the weapon in this. I'm, I'm, I, I, the reporter who receives this information, am given, given this information in order to afflict, inflict damage on this. Um, I think is super important in thinking about how, what can we do to mitigate that, right? Um, it, really, our mission is to tell the truth, right? So not saying anything is, is, is not the right answer. Um, but informing people about the context of what might have happened there as much as possible is, is crucial. And, um, and maybe even looking, looking the other way every now and then and figuring out why, uh, what, what is the agenda of the, of the individual that's given me that leak. Um, the fine, uh, another problem that... Hmm? Oh, okay. Um, another problem that I really see is kind of what happens when we run out of reporter attention. Again, there's so much data that's showing up that um, I think there's a real risk that um, reporters are just getting tired, that there's just not the energy to look through another 5,000 emails. Um, I was, I was um, in, a, in a meeting not, not too long ago where, where a reporter um, confessed to having read 800,000 documents or at least having reviewed in some form 800,000 documents in four weeks. I don't know, that, that, that means you definitely have no social life, you definitely have no, um, uh, no activity outside of that going on. Um, and, and I don't, don't know how often you can do that. And then there's also like a, a, a weird kind of problem for me as a technologist in this, right? So my, my origin, as you, as you mentioned, is kind of in the civic technology movement, right? And, and what we're good at is we're, we're good at looking at kind of uh, problems that are in, um, in society that are really hard on a, on, a, on, a, on a social level but are easy on a technical level, right? So making an app that will let people report where there's a pothole and then, and then have government go there and fix it. That's kind of our sweet spot, right? Because that's like a, a, a nice kind of social problem but it's really easy to fix on a technology level, right? But keeping 25 terabytes of leaks um, is actually both a hard societal problem and it is a hard technical problem from a security point of view but also just from a kind of infrastructure point of view. And that's actually a, a thing that we're, we're dealing with at, at, at this point. It's like how, 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 um, how do we actually um, become more and more of a, of a, of a software company and of a, of a platform operator um, that, that can actually do this sustainably and, and, and provide basically people that want to look into the offshore industry with, um, with the kind of connectivity, with the fullness of, of a picture that they, that they want to look at. Um, yeah, so um, again, if you have any ability that you want to share with us with regards to design, security reviewing, um, coding, um, that's the stuff we really need to, to figure out the technical end of it. And also if you have other, another interest or if you just want to kind of go for a browse um, and knock yourself out. Thank you very much. So uh, my plan would be to ask a question to each of you. And then I want to open to the audience because also if we speak about collective mobilization, I think they have to ask. And so the first question I wanted to ask to Ryan, um, because I mean, from your uh, presentation, we really understood how much you care about the openness and also uh, the uh, right of protection for the whistleblowers will um, and the possibility for the people to access uh, certain data. So. Uh, since you work uh, at the Intercept, I wanted to ask you something related to the Snowden Archive because uh, we just read recently uh, that there was the decision from the Intercept to shut down access to the Snowden Archive and also uh, to eliminate the trusted uh, research uh, team that is uh, taking care uh, of the security for it. So, uh, I mean, we also read about the concern of Laura Poitras about that uh, um, I mean, of course, you cannot speak for your own organization, but I want to know your perspective about this. I mean, how is possible to go on then? What is happening to the Snowden Archive? Uh, is going to be transferred somewhere else? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, um, I had, I, personally, I had no involvement in that decision. Um, 
I wish that decision hadn't been made. I think that we should still have that as a resource in New York where it was based. Um, but when I, I mean, when I started at the, when I got involved with working with interceptors back in 20, early 2014, and um, we actually didn't have any of the documents um, in America. There was too many fears legally about, uh, at that time, the government trying to potentially stop us working in the US. So I was actually working in Brazil um, with Glenn Greenwald and um, I couldn't work in England either because there was a legal risk there and the lawyers said you can't work there, they might try and put you in jail, so I had to end up going to Brazil. But the point I'm trying to make is we were, we were working with the documents outside of the US, now it, they've stopped. Um, they built an extraordinary um, sort of security infrastructure around the documents. We had like a special secure room that was built to the specification of the US federal government in terms of they call a SCIF, a secure facility, with like, um, you know, the metal through the walls and all that so no signals can get in. It's a crazy um, amount of resources they pumped into building that. Um, but but we so so that's not going to be there there anymore because simply the, 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 what we've been told is that the uh, the financial resources we had a whole team of we had like um, a security person we had um, an archivist and we had a couple of researchers as well and we were what what we've been told is that they they simply couldn't we, it was either a choice of getting rid of some reporters or we had to, they had to make cuts to the research budget and they, they, they decided that they were gonna, um, they had to get rid of the, the people who were working around the archive and as a consequence, because they didn't have the security provisions around it, that we were no longer be, gonna be able to keep it in New York. But from a personal perspective, um, I certainly still continue, to, um, still plan on continuing to do some stories based on that archive. Um, we're having conversations internally about how that's going to work. Um, but, but yeah, the facility in New York's been shut down. I think it's a really unfortunate decision. And it's not one that, that I, um, you know, that, that I support. I, I, I wish that we, we still had it. But it's just come down in the bottom line to, to money, and that's often the case. Um, other, all the other, new, like the, the Guardian, um, Washington Post, New York Times, they also had copies of the, the, the Snowden archive. Um, at least the large parts of it, and they also made the same decision, unfortunately, that they, um, they far, far sooner than we did, I mean, back in like, tw I think they stopped probably in like 2014, that they couldn't um, financially justify the resources that went into to, um, researching it and continuing to report on it versus the impact they were having on the stories that they were doing. And, um, you know, that's kind of the same calculation that, that our editors have, have come to, so. Yeah, so I would say that this also put us in front of an ethical problem because, uh, of course, from one side, is one side is important to, you know, um, preserve the security also of the whistleblowers, uh, but then if we see that Snowden, for example, really wanted uh, certain people to take care of uh, uh, his information and then uh, the organization decided to close this archive, I mean, it's really a dichotomy, no? Yeah, as I I think, um, yeah, is a, there's a bit of a contradiction there, but what I would say is that um, the chapter on that hasn't really closed yet. I mean, I think there's a lot to be worked out. Um, there was a lot of internal politics going on inside our, our organization about it, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think that it's unresolved and uh, that they're talking about um, furnishing a third party, like a research institute or something with the documents. But I, I expect that probably some, I don't think that it's the case that it's, it's just going to be shut down and no one ever again is going to like do stories or be able to research it. That's just not what's going to happen. But we've reached a sort of fork in the road at the moment. And, um, you know, so something, I think something will get figured out though in the long term. Then I have a question for Friedrich, <coughs> because I was trying to read uh, also a bit more the technical aspect of Aleph, uh, and I was reading that is an open source project, uh, as you say, that was indexing a large amount of data. But then uh, I also read that uh, um, to access a certain information, you also need to sign to OCCRP data, because uh, 
uh, there could be some data that uh, might help identifying uh, sources. Um, so, in a sense, I also feel how uh, do you guarantee this aspect of being uh, open source? Uh, I mean, how do you decide uh, who gets access to the data? Uh, because I understand also from your perspective, it's important that there is a sort of collective engagement. Uh, but how do you solve this kind of dichotomy among the fact that you also deal with really sensitive data that sometimes cannot be, you know, just uh, put online and the fact that you want to keep it open source? And then uh, uh, just, you know, a bit more general question. Uh, I'm curious about your perspective. If uh, you think there is a way to open up also part of the leaks related to the Panama Papers, the Snowden Archive, and the Troika Laundromat to the public, and if yes, uh, how could be done? For example, if you consider, you know, that of course you have to anonymize certain data, they cannot just put right out, uh, but uh, still I think there is the necessity also for the public to be informed about to what are these data, and we saw also the difficulty of, you know, going on reporting about that if uh, certain uh, research unit uh, are, are shut down. Okay, that's a lot of stuff and I apparently have two minutes to answer it. Um, <laughs> so minute one. Um, yes, so we were trying to do open source technology and we're trying to do open data as much as we can. Obviously there is stuff that we have on trust from sources and we cannot show it to other people. So I'm actually one of the few people who've read the Snowden documents in, in, some, uh, in some degree as inspirational reading because it's quite interesting to see how an, uh, an intelligence organization like the NSA kind of com compartmentalizes data. So what we've started doing is we're basically assigning code names to investigative projects. Um, uh, they don't have as cool uh, sounding names as the NSA does, um, but basically then if you are given that code word clearance, you get to see the data that is on some kind of understanding of privacy or uh, basically related to a particular investigative effort. And um, so we're trying to kind of build a thing that is both public, extremely public, and also extremely restrictive. And um, we also have to look at this to some extent um, from the point of data privacy, but more than that, kind of source confidentiality. Um, the other thing is, I think the, um, sorry, the second point it, uh, was. Um, like, uh, how you think uh, it's, it's possible to uh, open part of the leaks of the Panama Papers? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, not an um, archive. I think, yeah, I mean, we, we, wa we want to make as much open as possible, and I think kind of um, both what we've been doing with the previous laundromats, where we released kind of a summarized version of the, of the financial transactions, or at least the amounts given to particular companies, um, and what has happened with the Panama Papers, where they have released basically a structured database that anyone can access um, on, on the ICIJ's website, I think is kind of an, a good model, right? We're giving access to information that is um, the real information, that is kind of information that has been useful to our own reporters, um, but that also lacks certain kind of identifying criteria. I think in general there's a bit of a cult around kind of source documents, um, because you put out this document that has like a big stamp on it and the letterhead of some, some Russian Federation eagle, right? And, and it's all kind of very imp uh, impressive looking. And I think we're kind of in love with these things. I don't know whether, what, what the math is on that because there is a real risk of them containing some sneaky bit of printer magic or whatever it is that, um, that, 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 that really kind of ends up ends up really destroying our, 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 our trust as reporters. Um, but at the same, and so on the other hand, everybody has a copy of Photoshop, right? So putting a Russian eagle on a thing doesn't require being the Russian government, right? Um, so maybe also as a, as a kind of public of these things, we need to get over this cult of wanting to look at the one that has the stamp on it and has the, the signature on it and is like a bad fax from um, 1972 and, and can, can, can agree to live with the fact that maybe what we need is, is, is just to, to, to be given good information that kind of consolidates the story that a reporter has, 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 has fully solidified with evidence. I don't know, you grabbed the microphone as soon as I brought up the printer yeah, dots. Then I remembered you only had two minutes and I thought, no, I don't have the time. Um, no, I was just gonna say, uh, yeah, I totally agree with that and also, like on the series we've done on Google, for example, on the Dragonfly, the China search engine thing, um, I had we got documents on that, and we, the source actually has requested that we not publish them because 
publishing the documents uh, can lead um, a per person to help the authorities or the company or whoever it is identify a person. And also in the case of Snowden, you mentioned, um, should it be opened up all to the public? I mean, uh, hypothetically, it sounds like a great idea, but well, first of all, Snowden didn't want that to happen. He gave all those documents. He said, there's stuff in there that you shouldn't publish, but that is purely context, so you can understand. And he, doesn't, he didn't want it all published. And it also, uh, we get a lot. I mean, there's so many people who, who give us shit for not publishing all, more documents or not publishing all the documents or not just like dumping it on the internet for everyone to read. But those people, it always dumbfounds me that those people can take that position without having actually seen what's in there. You can't make a, a rational judgment on whether something should be published if you've not even seen it. And if you are trying to make that judgment, then you're a reckless person. Because, uh, frankly, there, there is stuff in there that shouldn't be published. And that's the reason why, you know, dozens of some of the best journalists in the world have looked at it and said, you know, no, that should stay um, where it is and we shouldn't report that. So, I mean, but it's a very, you know, there's, there's arguments that can be had. And, and, and I would always usually come down on that, um, publishing more rather than less. But I, I do totally also agree with you that there is a kind of fetishization of um, just publishing documents. And, and in some cases, we, again, the, the people who tell us, oh, publish more documents, publish more source documents, when we do that, I mean, we were publishing batches, um, hundreds of, of documents at a time of, from NSA. Um, a series called the Said Today Project. And what we were finding was that all those, those people who are constantly criticizing us for not publishing enough, they had never have anything to say about the hundreds of documents when we do publish them. They never analyze them, they never discuss them, they never share them. So what the hell are these people doing? They're, they're just like criticizing for the sake of criticizing, in my opinion. And you're always going to get those people uh, in every story you do. They're never happy. So, um, you know, I don't think they should be listened to. <laughs> Okay, so I think this is the right time to open to the public. <laughs> so, questions? Yes, over there, there are two ends. Hi, um, I was wondering what's your experience and your opinion on cooperation with public authorities such as public prosecutors? I mean, do you ever like file reports, come across something and pass on the information? We rely on pros public prosecutors as part of our audience. Um, the German um, federal police recently announced that they seized, I think, 50 million euros worth of property in many in Berlin and in, in, in Munich based on the Russian laundromat investigation that we did uh, three years ago. It's hard to remember now. Um, so. <laughs> Um, they, they are using this stuff even, even if um, we don't cooperate with them. If they want to give us information, on the other hand, um, my email address was on the board. I'm also available later. Uh, I would uh, just ask if uh, people speak in the public to use the microphone. But I would say there is a second question. Um, two short questions again. Um, one is, uh, do you already use blockchain technology for like sharing data or like storing data, or do you think you, do, are you considering it? Do you think it could be like any how useful? Um, second question: How does the GDPR affect your work? <laughs> that to both of us or to me. Um, the blockchain question. Honestly, I can I can answer it. I don't know. Um, we have technologists who who work who work with us, and part of the job they're actually doing is what Fred touched on. Um, they're also trying to develop some open source tools, um, and I'm sure they've looked into or considered that. And I wish they were here so they could answer your question because I'm not a good person to answer it. But um, the GDPR, no, it's not personally affected my work at all. At least not that I know of. You want to? Uh, um, on the blockchain, I think uh, no. Um, it's uh, we do have a censorship problem, but I think there are there are other ways that do not destroy the planet um, that can also help us circumvent censorship. Um, given the choice between um, a blockchain and an FM radio, I'm going to pick the FM radio. Um, 
but um, with regards to GDPR, yes, I think for, for, for us that is a concern. Um, we hold a lot of personal information. There are exemptions in GDPR, um, Article 85, 86, that kind of exempt um, journalistic activity from that, um, but that puts a burden on us to also then perform professional journalistic tasks rather than messing around. There is somebody over there. A hand several times and now it disappeared. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering during the, like in general, but also um, especially during the Raiffeisen uh, suggestion where the, where the stocks apparently dropped at a point, I was wondering one, if that does anything or if that like just means that like money is like shifted elsewhere, um, you know, like is that just like a drop um, in the ocean? And then I was wondering like um, on the bigger scale, so to speak, I was wondering that in the last panel uh, through the term corruption, I'm gonna do it through, through that because I think it's easier. Like if, I, I was wondering like if the, if the, um, if, um, if certain ways of uh, getting around legislation and of like shifting money around, et cetera, et cetera, so deeply involved in, um, in the ways in which states work and in which like civil society works, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what does it mean in that context to like use the, um, the means of civil society that you are apparently using? Like what are you, like, I would think, I would think if you are, um, if you if you make the question evil, you would you would think, um, isn't that like just, isn't that just reiterating the running ideology that if we are a stronger civil society, we could change uh, the system, and if we um, stand in for more transparency, everything is going to change, et cetera, et cetera. Which is actually just covering the underlying. Um, mechanisms, question mark. Uh, but who do you want to do this question? Just to... Is this a question? This is Friedrich an open question. or Ryan? Uh, <laughs> both of them. This is an open question for okay. discussion. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to the, to the Raiffeisen thing, basically I think we're putting risk into banking and that's probably a good thing, right? If you are a bank in Europe right now and you are still facilitating this stuff, the fact that now every, every year, three years running, we've been able to kind of un, uh, un, unveil a multi-billion dollar money laundering scheme um, is, is putting uh, the fear of God into you, I hope. Um, the evidence I have for that is that uh, is Danske Bank, basically. So we started off, um, we weren't uh, the only ones reporting on this, but basically we, we got bank records that indicated um, a $3 billion money laundering scheme that was used by the government of Azerbaijan, by, by, by someone in Azerbaijan, um, to, um, to, to bribe European politicians and other things. Um, and um, then an invest internal investigation at Danske Bank has now upped the number to somewhere around 200 billion euros um, that they suspect they might have laundered in terms of dirty cash. And at this point, it's a real likelihood that they just get unwound. Um, this is also not entirely out of the, out of the possibility on Swedbank. Um, Deutsche Bank is a candidate for being unwound in that way if, if anyone were to find banking records that on my, uh, my email box. Um, so basically if you, if you kill three, four banks, I think the other ones are going to behave. Um, uh, with, with regards to the civil society question, I didn't fully understand it, but there's like a, a really interesting phenomen a phenomenon where civil society has actually moved into offshore, and that's basically liberation movements. So you have a lot of movements in mostly southern Africa that started off as oppositional forces, and because they weren't allowed in their own countries, they had to kind of set up offshore financial structures. Now they are in power, and some of them have kind of kept the offshore financial structures and are now using it to um, uh, remove some of the proceeds. Um, that's a really interesting uh, outcome, I feel, in terms of, yeah, good intentions going awry. Ryan? Maybe I want to uh, connect to the question related to the discourse of the civil society, because uh, 
by going back to the previous question, I mean, I also understand that it is uh, easy to say, let's open everything, let's publish everything. But still, I think it's important also to discuss together on the discourse of uh, collective mobilization, because as you were also saying, now we are drawn by data, you know, there are so many leaks uh, and so many data to analyze. And at the same time, I also feel that uh, in general, for example, here in Berlin, if we uh, think about the time around 2013, there was a really strong uh, civic engagement, uh, uh, you know, uh, after the Snowden leaks uh, for Chelsea Manning and so on. And uh, I feel that, uh, you know, a bit of that uh, passion is, a bit, is gone. And at the same time, there are still people paying. I mean, Snowden is still in Russia, Chelsea Manning is back in prison. And, uh, uh, but still, how is it still possible to have uh, the interest of the people to care about this subject? Also because, as you say, now the leaks are getting so huge that then, you know, they all float on organization like yours that you have to <laughs> do a lot of work. But how can you also engage, you know, interest from the civil society? to help also your work? Um, well, I think that um, a big part of it, like a lot of the, I think especially in the area of, um, I was gonna talk about it in my little presentation earlier, but the, the document dumps, ones that don't come directly to a journalist. We're seeing more and more of these cases of um, a hacker or someone who's, who's just actually taken it upon themselves to publish gigabytes of data on the internet. So they've not even bothered to go to the journalist. They've just dumped it all there for everyone in the world to download. There's a real um, role for the, for the public. I, like, you know, you call them citizen journalists or, or whoever are researchers in those cases because you, 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 there's, there's no, um, there, there is no news organization involved. You can go and actually research those documents. And what, we, what you found during the, did you remember the case with the, um, the Sony emails that got hacked and they were all dumped on, on the internet. And then there was a couple of cases of, of surveillance companies called Hacking Team and Gamma Group, uh, which I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, who were hacked by, a, by a, a sort of politically motivated hacker and all those documents were dumped online. We were getting great tips from the public about those documents where people had um, dug into them themselves and, and sending tips and, and resulted in some good stories actually. Uh, so, so that's a role and you don't need anyone's approval to go and do it, you can just go and do it yourself. Um, I also think there's, the, there's a real absence of an organization. Um, with the, the example of the Sony emails, it fascinated me that what, what you tend to find is when there's one of these document dumps, it creates a lot of noise for like a few days or maybe a week or two, but then it just goes away and people kind of forget about it. And um, that happened with those Sony emails. It was a huge scandal at the time. It was making headlines all across the world. And then it just, people forgot about it, but there was still like tens of thousands of emails there that people hadn't looked at. And then what happened was WikiLeaks went and took it upon itself to go and to index those emails and make a set, put it into, so you could just go and search it almost like a uh, Google specifically for these, these emails and these Sony emails. And then um, as soon as WikiLeaks done that, there was another round of stories by a lot of established news organizations. And what that tells you is that those news organizations themselves had not sufficiently researched and archived and made indexed and made searchable those documents. They actually waited and relied on someone else to do it. And so I think there's still a, that was a real public service that WikiLeaks did actually when it done that. And I think there's a real, um, it would be, it would be, I would love it if there was a, an organization was funded solely to try to make accessible some of these dumps that are already just out there in the public domain. Um, because, uh, you know, it, it would just help reporters and also ordinary, um, or people in any, any walk of life, academics, researchers, just ordinary citizens to, to actually make use of those um, archives of information. We're trying our very best to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Other questions? I can, yes, over there. So Ryan mentioned that there, you talk with some journalists and they were saying that there were certain parts of the leaks that should not be published. I would be curious to know 
like what was the argument for publishing? Can you provide any details? Like, for example, which type of information should not be made public? Which type of information, and w where are the gray zones? Um, well, usually, usually we would be talking about when it's harm to life. Uh, there are cases, especially when you're dealing with like top secret documents, where there there might be n names of people who have been informants. There might be particular assets of uh, say the, the government or an uh, uh, intelligence agency that is not known publicly but that is in a, in a conflict zone like let's say for example hypothetically in, in the middle of Iraq or Syria or somewhere uh, where Islamic State is fighting a war uh, and the US is in there with special forces and all the rest of it and you, if you publish that information there is a risk, not a certainty but a risk that people might be harmed, people might die. And so th those are really the decisions you're making. So when it, when, it, when it comes to that, when there's even, for me, when there's even a 5%, a 1%, a 2% risk that, that, that somebody could be harmed as, as a result of what you're doing, physically harmed, when, and when also usually what, in any, um, any leak of information that you have and that you're going to publish, you always go to the people and you say, look, we're going to do this, do you have any comment on that? And sometimes they will come back to you and they, they, will, they will know context that you don't know about a particular person or a particular thing, and, and they, they will make serious um, statements to you that, that, that uh, the case to you that, that people could be harmed as a result of it. Those are the sorts of examples where, where, we, would, where we would come down on the side of redaction. Um, but, you know, there, there are many complicated uh, decisions that you have to make through. It's often there's a lot of debate and discussion and there'll be multiple reporters and editors involved in it. But, but the, 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 the ones where um, we're doing most of the redactions is when it's just really about physical harm. Um, sometimes also actually with NSA documents, there's, um, there's a privacy issue because you could actually be disclosing um, confidential emails of a person that they've intercepted and that person is being accused of doing X, Y, and Z. And if you, expo if you reveal that, it would be defamatory towards that person and also a violation of their privacy. And so you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, we actually had a case where we did publish a uh, person's emails that had been intercepted by NSA, a, a guy in New Zealand. Um, and he consented to that. We actually went to him and uh, we, we discussed it with him. And he had been, it was a crazy case, and he'd been actually wrongly targeted using the, the PRISM um, surveillance system. And, um, but, but yeah, generally speaking, we would try to avoid um, be, you know, unnecessary violations of people's rights by, through publication of inf private information about them. We have time for a couple of questions, one there. Um, yes, I just wanted to ask um, if you could uh, tell me uh, how would you empower whistleblowers to avoid what Ryan talked about, um, this whole profiling, logging system, so kind of the step before secure dropping, sending stuff to organizations like yours. Do you touch on that? Like, do you have no of any initiative or, or tools or something? Um, well, I think the best thing we, ha we do have at the moment is secure drop. I mean, it, that when I was talking earlier about the first contact problem, that is intended to try and eliminate that because the first step that the person will be taking um, is that they will be, to contact you will be that they'll be going on, they, will ha they have to download a Tor browser and then go and that protects their um, anonymity because it hides their IP address and then they can send a message which is encrypted and then so there's, there's no um, connection and we've actually found that to be really quite effective. I mean we, we've had some very big stories, some of them that have triggered investigations in the United States by um, you know federal agencies. Um, and they've not been able to identify our sources. Uh, so it is an effective system if used correctly. Um, but you know, it isn't foolproof either. And like I said also before, sometimes people aren't, aren't necessarily, don't have the knowledge, they don't know that that's the first point of contact. So they might just send an email, a normal email, and you know, that can create problems. But, um, 
yeah, we're always trying to encourage people and we have a lot of information on our s website about how, what is the best first step to, to contact and how to do it in a secure way. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we're always looking for um, people to come up with new ideas and so probably someone down the line will maybe invent something that's even better, but secure drops certainly the best we have currently. Uh, I also see a lot of charming kind of low-tech solutions, right? Like anything where you as a, as a human can conceptualize in your mind what are the things that co could go wrong is, is obviously better than using like technology where none of us understand anything about what is going to go wrong until it's already happened. Um, recently there was a, was a case that really frightened me where um, a, a employee of FinCEN, the American Financial Intelligence Organization, was fired um, because they had intercepted that she was using um, signal from her workplace and um, they correlated it to a leak um, so that kind of stuff is already getting weird um, so yeah I, I, I think the difficult thing is how do you communicate with people before they do something wrong I've literally received emails from government email addresses asking how do I leak information to you to which then the response has, uh, response has to be never talk to a reporter again if you want to keep your job right or like <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I I wish we had a conundrum, uh, had a solution for this conundrum of how to kind of yeah give the get, get that information to people more effectively before they've already made decisions that are that are really hard to unwind later. Um, I think a lot of our reporting is is based on on very kind of low tech um, outcomes. So the last question, nobody. Okay, uh, then I think if there are no other questions, I would just uh, first of all like to thank you for this great panel. And then I want to, to tell everybody to come in 15 minutes because we will have the screening of the Panama Papers. And also, uh, since we will have the film that will be introduced by Lieke, I just want to mention what will happen tomorrow. So uh, just remember to come back because uh, we will start uh, at 3.30 with the artistic talk of uh, RYBN, The Great Offshore. Um, then we have uh, the Panama Papers uh, keynote with uh, Frederick Obermeier, moderated by Max Haywood from Transparency International. And then a really important panel that is, uh, I would say, also follow up from what we discussed today, uh, that is about uh, uh, the, um, um, the consequence uh, of whistleblowing, uh, truth-telling, and also reporting in the field of uh, anti-corruption and offshore. Um, and so we will have with us really great and brave people that I'm so honored to have here. Uh, Pelin Unker, uh, Stephanie Gibault, then we will have Khadija Ismaniova from uh, you know, Azerbaijan that will speak uh, on video because she is not allowed to be here, unfortunately. Um, and uh, we will also start uh, the panel by mentioning uh, the case, uh, the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia. And this panel will be moderated by Michael Hormi of uh, some Transparency International. So, Please come back also tomorrow and stay here for the screening of the film. And we are also really proud because it's the German premiere. So uh, come back in 15 minutes. And again, thank you so much for this panel.